community such as a church since we are the first responder. At least we are the people who are most uh, obvious and available in the church. There are many sources. One is diversity. You know, when you put together people who think differently, brought up differently, grew up in a different situation, you put them together, even the way of speaking, and the way of eating, the way of walking can be misinterpreted as hostility or most time. So the existence of diversity, diverse people in the church poses risk for conflict. Also, some unmet need. When people come to church, they come because they want to pray. They want to get closer to God. And they want to ask God for something. So basically, the church becomes a conglomeration, a combination of people who come because of different needs. And through this, when one feels that his needs or her needs are being ignored, then there seems to be incompatibility on what is essential and what needs to be done. Then conflict may arise. Conflict may arise. In fact, my dear brothers and sisters, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 1, you remember that uh, in those days, in the early church, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. This is the very background of the formation of the deacons in the early church. Now, this is to me very enlightening. Because deacons and deaconesses are born as a solution to an existing conflict in the church, not as a conflict makers in the church. Deacons and deaconesses come about because they are the answer to an existing question and a proposal to an existing conflict. There is already an ongoing fight between the Jews and between the Greeks. Because they perceive that the widows of the Greek members of the early church are being, they are not being taken care of. And so they have elected, they said, let's choose seven men. And from there, they were called the deacons. Again, they are born, they existed as a part of the solution to the conflict or the need of the church. Other sources are you know, wrong perceptions where once again some actions or words are interpreted differently other than the way it was originally intended. So you mean one thing, but because the other guy is not, you know, having a good day, you are misinterpreted. Uh, so this happens. Other things are power, the capacity to act effectively and ability to influence. How power is defined uh, and use plays a role in almost every conflict. Some may feel that you know they are being overhanded, underhanded, or being taken advantage of, and uh, conflict may arise out of that. Um, other areas of sources of conflict, uh, brothers and sisters, are distorted thinking. You know, you have an exaggerated, irrational thought pattern involved in the onset of perpetuation of psychological states such as anxiety or changes in one's life. Uh, problem in organization or probably in the family when our members are undergoing changes they come to church uh, it can be a source of conflict or probably change in leadership uh, change in pastoral leadership or change in preferences I've been in the church for so long that you see that even the changes in the color of the wall can become a source of conflict <laughs> I remember one time when one of my churches in the district we're planning to replace the curtain. They go back and forth, back and forth, uh, trying to decide regarding the color of the curtain. When finally they have decided to uh, purchase a certain color of the curtain, some of the lady protested that, wow, that one looks so ugly. <laughs> and that becomes the beginning of a long drawn battle between members. A curtain is simple as that. These communications can also become a source of conflict. You communicate one thing, perceive another way based on the filters and biases on those who are listening. 
Very basic is the differences in the personality I mentioned earlier. So, these are some of the sources. But primarily in a work-related environment, such as the Deacons and the Deaconesses, and the church organization, the focus is also a driver of conflict. Other people are focused on tasks, meaning, let's do this, regardless of how it is done or how it is communicated. As long as we have completed the task, we're happy for, uh, you know, when we ended the Sabbath, at least we're able to do this. But some, some are focusing on relationships. You know, they may go and work on things slowly, uh, but, you know, they are keen not to offend people and to ensure that, you know, conflict will be mitigated. When one is focusing heavily on tasks, the approach is this must be done quickly. Because, you know, we must be able to finish the task. When one is focused on relationship, the approach is methodical, slowly. Ensuring that everyone understands the task instead of rushing to finish the task. The one focusing on the task or the work, the approach is dominance because the intention is for one to communicate well that the task must be done quickly. Uh, the approach of those people who are focusing on relationships are trying to win mutual grounds. Like, mm, okay, is this okay with you? Are you comfortable with this? Uh, those who are focused on the task simply is, well, whether you like this or not, you know, this is our job. <laughs> we must do this. Alright? And the, the person who's focusing on tasks, the approach is simply to finish, to complete. The one focusing on relationship, the approach is basically on resolution. Meaning, having a win-win situation. So what are the strategies? Common strategies. And you are familiar with this, like I said, I will not be delving much on this. Because these are very common, these are very normal. But uh, just to remind each of us, common strategies when one faces conflict are either to fight, to fly, or to freeze. Some experts suggest that the flight or the fight or flight response may even provide benefits when the urge to fight others in an attempt to harm them is instead transform into the urge to fight to protect them. So some people when they go to conflict, you know, they they are really like head on goes into it. You know, they they could not be stopped. And suddenly in in my church, in my long years of ministry, there are Christians, meaningful Christians who are like that. Because of the spur of the moment, the heightened emotion, the feeling of being offended and being threatened, the decision, the primal, seemingly the primal decision is to fight. They, you scratch my back, I'll break yours. <laughs> Others choose to fly away, attend other churches, simply cut off communication and stop attending church. And you, you immediately wonder what, what happened. I remember one day in one of my districts in the Philippines, when suddenly a very active member, uh, head deaconess, stops attending church. Holy, what happened to Sister Black? Oh, Pastor, you don't know. Tell me. Well, I stopped attending church for three Sabbaths already, so I, I started to notice. By the way, I have a district. I have 13 churches. And so I noticed this lady, one very active lady, is not attending church. I asked why. Oh, Pastor, you don't know. Tell me about it. And I was told, this lady, in one of the nights of my evangelistic meeting, invited me over for dinner. I was almost 10 p.m. Almost 10 p.m. So I politely declined and said, thank you so much, but you know, I really, I had a long day, I'm really sleepy, uh, I'm not eating tonight. Besides, it's too late already. She was so offended that she stop coming to church for three weeks. So some people are like that. They simply disappear in the radar. And if we are not clear, if we are not aware, uh, people may simply disappear. And in the latest data provided to us by the General Conference, 
about 40% of our members, when they stop attending church, nobody contacts them. You can check on me on this. If you like, you can Google me. And the data is available in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that when one just stop attending church, nobody bothers. And they know the address of the church, ah, they can come. Sometimes they just simply fly away and totally disappear. Others, you know, they pay debt. When they get into conflict, they say nothing, do nothing, and you know, ignore. You know, this is uh, according to some psychologists, it's a primate instinct or some instinct of the animals. Have you seen dog who are being threatened by a bigger animal? They suddenly just collapse, <laughs> do nothing, with the hope that the threat will, you know, pass away and we will be able to manage to come back to life. So, what are your strategies when you get into conflict with your wife, with your children, with your boss, with your colleagues? What do you do? Do you fight? Please. But some husbands play deaf. Yeah. <laughs> play deaf. Okay. Some very unhealthy strategies <laughs> on my experience are this. You know, people would want to use power in destructive ways. And he who has the power at the start usually gets the advantage. Uh, they have the polarized attitude that, you know, a loser is necessary and does not heal relationship. So some would say, okay, just say sorry. I, 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 I remember one time when uh, I observed, when I was still a student, I observed, good thing, this is not in a church setting, but in a school setting. But the, the one I'm observing, because I'm one of the student leaders, are pastors, administrators. And we were called in, into the office. And immediately the the one leading the meeting says, Okay, huh? We know who's a called here. Just say sorry. Come on, say sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Something is amiss here. So some would want to immediately set up the whole thing by saying, Okay, oh you say sorry, you say sorry, shake hands, okay, then you go. Okay. It's not healthy. It's not the healthiest way to deal with conflict or avoidance. Or even bargaining, where each gives up something but remains unsatisfied. It defines power in terms of what one, when one can coerce from the other, or what one can get from the other, or simply bargaining. But when they leave the table, they still, you know, they still murmur, they still complain, they remain unsatisfied. Some also do the band aid, the quick fix approach. It creates the illusion that fundamental issues have been addressed. It often produces a heightened lack of confidence in conflict resolution procedures. You know what is that? A band aid approach of pastors and elders and deacons and church leaders? When members approach us with problem and with conflict, they spray all the time. Okay. <laughs> you know, I pray for you. You pray about it loud. Often time we mean well, but the experience when we do like that, we are doing a band aid approach. So we are sweeping things under the carpet and it's only a matter of time before it finally blew up to our face. So of course, you know, with different personalities, at times you just simply want to, to, to put the conflict at rest. But by doing so, we're actually enlarging the conflict. Okay. The other one, unhealthy strategy, is the role playing. Oh, you know, I, I'm the boss here, I'm the teacher here, or I'm the parent here. It relates to roles and structures rather than to person. Are you listening up? Why are we, why are we doing this? Papa, papa. I'm your parent. Just listen. Like that. Or because I'm the pastor, you should listen. Not good. Unhealthy. Okay? Blaming is also an unhealthy strategy. The goal is to identify who is at fault and embarrass them instead of redemptively seeking to restore. And mind you, my dear brothers and sisters, this I see often in the church setting. Blaming people. Blaming. And you know, the funny part is sometimes we even blame Satan. Oh, Satan, ah. Satan really strong. <laughs> <laughs> Satan attacks us again. Instead of addressing the underlying issues of our relationship, not that I'm defending Satan, no? It says that at times, we must address the underlying cause or problem. And at times, it's not, it's not always spiritual. At times, it is. 
But more often than not, it is emotional underlying issues. And later, we'll see how we are going to approach that. So what are the steps? Okay, this I want that to focus in the next few minutes, hopefully in the next 10 minutes. Number one, when someone approach you, brother, you know, I'm having problem with uh, sister so-and-so. You know, I don't like the pastor. You know, the sermon right uh, today, uh, I think, wanted to you know, hit us. So, you know, because you're the decoys, you're always there, you're hanging out, you know, and sometimes they blurt out, they want to share with you their feeling and emotion. What do you do? That is already becoming a source of conflict. When they when they blurt out. Number one, you clear the process. Do not just say, ah, yeah, 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 I agree with you. Oh, Pastor, no, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, I also don't like the pastor. No. <laughs> also, the other ones I don't like. Don't worry, yeah, don't worry, two of us. <laughs> Remember, decos and deaconesses are born out of a solution to existing church problem and not to create problems. We are here to help the church to solve problems and to become a solution to problems of the church. Amen? Amen. So don't wonder why we always do this because we are problem solver. Amen? We are here, the ministry of deacons and deaconesses exists to fight the problems of the church. Not to fight the church and become problem of the church. So number one, when you hear complaints, you know, people talking about someone else. Well, that's what we like, you know. Oh, you know, you, you hear them. <laughs> you hear them, you know what happened. Huh? Tell me, tell me. <laughs> then it becomes the source of conflict already. Whenever you hear someone speaking anything against someone, as leaders of the church, as deacons and deaconesses, as Christians, this is what we must do, clarify the process. And the process is this. Spell it here in Matthew 18, 15. Can we read this? Okay, ready, go. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him in his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have made your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three, witnesses and reward may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell him to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. My brothers and sisters, this counsel is coming from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ himself. This is very important. The Lord knows in his infinite wisdom how to handle conflict. Jesus knows the best way to approach problem in the church or disagreement among members and among people. The best way is to follow the advice of Jesus Christ. And that is the process that we must follow. Ellen White commented in Testimonies, Volume 7, page 216. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, Christ declared, Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Do not tell others of the wrong. One person is told, then another, and still another, and continually the report grows and the evil increases. Till the whole church is made to suffer. Settle the matter between thee and him alone. This is God's plan. So whenever people will come to us, and you know, they have problem with other people, what do we do? Okay, have you spoken to that person? If not, go and speak to that person. Do not speak to me. Because that matter must be settled between the two of you. If in case the person will not listen to you, then bring me over. Let us talk together. But if you have not done so yet, you must go and first settle it with your brother or with your sister. Ellen White again, in testimonies for the churches, this one I have taken from uh, the church manual, if matters of difficulty between brethren were not being open before others, but frankly spoken between themselves in the spirit of Christian love, how much evil might be pre prevented? How many roots of bitterness whereby many are defiled would be destroyed? And how closely and tenderly might the followers of Christ be united in His love? You know, if only brethren were open 
in frankly speaking between themselves in the spirit of Christian God, how much evil might be prevented? You know, because sometimes when when one is offended, he would want to get as many people on his side. And so he will he or she will tell the story and share the stories in the effort to gain following and more on his side. But the counsel of the Lord is, do not tell anyone. If one is genuinely concerned to resolve the matter, one will go straight to the person whom he or she is offended. But like I said, you know, I have long list in the early slides whereby people, you know, we have unbalanced people, anxious people, depressed people, people who have, you know, going through the changes in their life. What will we do? What will we do when finally, you know, the whole thing, without the person concerned knowing, the whole church already knows. And somebody will just whisper, what's happening? I don't know. I don't know what's happening. And many times in my church, this also happens. There are many things that's happening already, I do not know. I have no idea. And then finally, because of the, the whispers, it reaches my ear and then I am made aware of this. But so many evils may be prevented if the counsel of our Lord and Jesus Christ is followed. Number two, when you clarify to the person the process on how to settle the conflict and they agree to talk and probably you become involved, you create a safe space. The personal preparation, the timing, location, initial opening statement, avoid lock, locking yourself into rigid demands of what the solution must be. Just simply be open. Meaning, as a deacon and as a deaconess, you now become the negotiator, the middleman, the one to mediate, hopefully to mediate, not to, not to throw more fuel into the fire, but to lower the fire. Okay? I remember uh, a very good counsel given me when I was still a young pastor by a very seasoned pastor and in one of my churches in the district there there was a heavy conflict that the church was divided and it becomes a church planting activity the church planting because half of the church leave the church and you know poor uh, church planting <laughs> I was so like, I was not able to sleep for several nights. Brethren, I could not sleep. I was still very young. I think I was still 24 years old. I could not sleep for several nights already. So I, I consulted one of the nearby districts, uh, the pastor. He said, Pastor, what to do? Well, in, in situations like this, it's just like you are cooking the rice on the fire. You know, in the Philippines, you know, we use food to cook the rice on a pot, right? Okay. Do not open the lid, just lower the fire. Oh, because you know when you put a lot of fire, it will boil, and then the, the, the water will spill out of the pot, right? And there will be more trouble. So instead of adding more fire, just lower the fire, do not open it yet. You know, let it settle for a while. Create a safe space. Number three. Uh, in Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth and love, they grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ. Sometimes this is our problem. When we have the truth, anyhow we say. They also say, regardless of how they feel, because that's the truth love. But the Bible counsels us, we must speak the truth in love. I remember one time, in the Sabbath school class, in one of my churches, Sabbath school class. It becomes a uh, venue for debate. So two elder, uh, one elder and one ministry leader argue over a point in the Sabbath school classes. And slowly they shouted. And slowly the rest of the Sabbath school, Sabbath school classes around the congregation stops and started listening to that, to their whole conversation. Because it was too loud. Finally, one was so offended that decided to storm the church out, go back to his house. This is a true story. 
Oh. The church is still existing today. Go back to his house, take a jungle polo. A jungle polo. A night, a long night. Oh, wow. A long night, not a kitchen night, not a bread night. Samurai. It's a... Samurai. Samurai. Samurai is really long. The jungle polo, the one they used to act the, the pigs in the jungle, right? Yeah. Uh, the one they used in farming. Get and start to chase the other inside the church. And people, you know, just scattered along the church crying. So I'm, uh, after a while there were barangay people, the village chairman, and all some police there, you know. That's before divine service. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I visited the place, because uh, I was in another church, when I visited the place, I was with the police and uh, some, you know, Barangay, the, the village chairman, some some people in it was it was uh, the church was well known, but the church was well known in the village in the town not because of the good news, <laughs> but because of the bad news that happens. So what do we do? What do we do, brethren? I started sitting down with the. Elder and one ministry leader, you know, and finally they 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 were planning to sue each other, you know, because one was trying to kill the other. But you know, uh, when when cool heads prevail after a few days, uh, they decided to pull out all the cases and decided to have an amicable settlement. Finally, the police told us, oh, Pastor, settle your members, talk to your members." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I began to clarify with them, what's the issue? What did you quarrel? And then that one getting a jungle bolo from your house, going back and chasing the elder with your bolo? What's the issue? Do you know what's the issue? That they are debating? They are debating about March 7, 19, regarding the food. What food is that that goes in and goes out does not define? Is it a literal food or spiritual food? See, it ends up in the show of the And I even told them that should not be our issue. That should be the issue uh, for other people, for other religion. To, to us, this is very clear. Which one is, you know, which one is defining the people? And Jesus Christ was very clear in Mark uh, 7, 21. For it is from the heart that evil comes. Adultery, murder, deed, and things like that. What defines the person is his sin, not the food. So you have to clarify the issue. What's really wrong? And when you when you when you want to clarify the issue, this is what I have learned in my 20 plus years of ministries. Listen very carefully now. Do not believe the person telling you his or her story until you are able to listen to all sides of the story. Never believe. I was fooled many times as a pastor. You sympathize, they cry, you know. It seems, it seems that truly they are the one or you know being abused. Truly they're the one, you know, being taken advantage of. Sometimes they can misrepresent other people so easily. <clears throat> Until you finally listen to you know, other sides. And when you are finally able to listen to other sides, then you will be able to better help them. There are, there are not only two sides to stories. There are like many sides to stories. From the perspective of the one experiencing it, from the perspective of the one receiving it, and from the perspective of the one serving it. So, you have to clarify the issue and focus on the needs, not demands. Very recently, I am involved in a conflict in the church. Personally involved in the conflict of the church. Of whom the names I intentionally withhold because they are still alive. <laughs> There are demands. Store. If you want me, you want me, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. I said, mm -hmm. okay, that's your demand. But underlying all those demands 
Sometimes it's a frightened heart that needs something else. Maybe they need affirmation, acceptance. Maybe they need some simply a listening. You know, sometimes, so one must be really slow taking the, the information, taking time to sit down, and taking time to listen, and not jumping immediately to, you know, giving in to demands. Try to outline and try to identify what's the need. What does this uh, tell me about the person's need, really, so that you'll be able to deal with them? You know, sometimes when 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 my wife is uh, throwing fits or tantrums or sometimes she doesn't want to speak to me, I think, what does she need? I can fight. I can also quarrel. But you know, being a pastor, a Christian, does she need? Does she need help today? Did I forget to bring her? You know, greet her. Is this the anniversary time already? Then I check my calendar. No, not, not her birthday, not her anniversary, not her anniversary. So good. So instead of me just merely reacting to you know the, my wife being upset, I need to know what's the need, what's really going on, and you know, and it eliminates conflict rather than uh, breathing more conflict. When you sit down, you know, most of the times when I listen to people, like as a pastor, I sit mostly in the office, in sometimes in coffee shops, sometimes in restaurants, sometimes in my home, sometimes in members' home, listening to people quarreling. Like my brothers and sisters, you would not believe how many times I've sat down, countless times already. I've sat down, and the, sometimes they even bring their friends. You know, oh, pastor, I have a friend. <laughs> And they are, they are having conflict with someone else, or the husband and wife. They are not even members. Can you help? I said, okay. What do we mean? So, instead of us simply blaming each other, because when they finally sit down, the, the, the party is finally not. Even in the presence of a pastor, my brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Even in the presence of elders and pastors, you know, they are prepared to attack. Yeah. They are prepared to attack. You will be surprised. All the happy Sabbath, all the kindness, all the Christian spirituality, humility, all gone. And the intention somehow when it's down is fight. You are because of you, because of you, like this, like this, like that. But when you, as a leader of the church, as deacons and deaconesses, whenever you listen, so what are our options? What are the solutions? After listening to you know all their ranting, all their emotion, your goal is to focus on solutions. What do we do? Pray to God. Ah, I escape. <laughs> It's very good, yeah. Of course, we, we really have to pray. But first, you will have, later on, you will have to enumerate one by one what are the options. How do we move forward from this? Okay, from this dilemma. And later on, I'll give you some example of this. Then, when you finally are able to zoom into some proposals to the solutions, like, okay, this is my solution. Solution number one, solution number two, solution number three. What do you think is the best? What do you think is the best? Brothers and sisters, whenever you are facing conflict or you are dealing with conflict or at least mediating in conflict, do not provide solutions, however tempted you may be. Let them provide solutions. And this is what I learned. This is what I learned. Most of the time, they know what to do already. It's just that they are not that quarreling yet. They know, always they know. Always they know. You tell me. Always they know the right thing. Always they know what to do. They just don't want to do. <laughs> different, huh? different. Different than knowing what to do and wanting to do, but they know is the